in 2011, I, I saw Roy give a presentation called The Activism of the Real, and I was blown away by Roy speaking. And I was so blown away by Roy speaking that I wanted to read more of Roy's work. And as I began to read more of Roy's work, I realized that there were two Roys. There's the Roy that writes academically for an academic audience, and there's the Roy that speaks. And I've also been privileged to attend Roy's reading group, where Roy does presentations, gives presentations on critical realism. And listening to Roy speak is unbelievable. It, it's, it's incredible, and, and it's a real honor that Roy has agreed to spend the next two hours with us talking about critical realism, and specifically talking about basic critical realism. The, the idea of, of Roy offering that sense of, of critical realism as a form of emancipation is wonderful, and I'm really pleased that he's here. But there's a couple of other people I want to thank as well. I have to thank Donald Clark, because if it wasn't for Donald, we would still be trying to work out how to get working this afternoon. And I also have to thank, um, I have to thank Paul Thompson, who's the PLE, or the Virtual Learning Environment Coordinator. And it's Donald that helped her. It's, it's Paul that helps get everything together to run Blackboard Collaborate. And I also have to thank Roy for being here. So I'm going to invite Roy to speak now. Uh, and I know he's there. Hi, yes. Roy. <laughs> Hi, Gary. <laughs> we, we, nice Roy, to see you as well. <laughs> Roy and ourselves are in the same room at the, uh, the Institute of Education. I, I'm in one side of the room. Roy's on the other side of the room. So uh, thank you, Roy. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, so um, uh, this is the first of um, uh, three talks, and um, uh, these three talks will constitute uh, a kind of introduction to critical realism. And um, so to begin with, I'm, say, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the divisions of uh, critical realism, the divisions within it. Uh, so it, it's um, customary to talk about three phases of critical realism. Uh, the first phase is called basic critical realism, the second is called dialectical critical realism, and the third is known as the philosophy of meta-reality. So today will be about basic or uh, original uh, critical realism, which is presupposed by the other two. And this basic critical realism, which I'm going to talk about today, um, is itself uh, divided, if you like, into three. Uh, the first is called transcendental realism, which is a philosophy of science. The second is called critical naturalism, which is a philosophy of social science. And the third is known as the theory of explanatory critique, which uh, is a, a form of uh, ethics. So. Uh, before I actually launch into uh, basic critical realism, um, I want to say something by way of introduction about the critical realist approach to philosophy and uh, the critical realist approach to uh, critical realism. So I'm going to say uh, a few words which I'm going to um, uh, divide into six uh, uh, main points. Uh, so I'll just briefly state the points uh, before I say a little bit about each of them. So the first point is uh, philosophical underlaboring. The second is seriousness. The third is imminent critique. Uh, the fourth is the idea of philosophy as uh, presuppositions. Uh, the fifth, it, it, we could say, is uh, enhanced reflexivity or transformative, transformed practice, and the sixth is uh, the principle of uh, metacism. So the first, uh, philosophical underlaboring, um, gives us the point of critical realism. And I can best introduce this uh, by reading a quote from uh, John Locke, who uh, initiated the metaphor of underlaboring. John Locke said, the commonwealth of learning is not at this time without master builders, whose mighty designs in advancing the sciences will leave lasting monuments to the admiration of posterity. But everyone must not hope to be a Boyle or a Sydenham, and in an age that produces such masters as the great Eugenius 
and the incomparable Mr. Newton, with some others of that strain, it is ambition enough to be employed as an underlaborer in clearing the ground a little and removing some of the rubbish that lies in the way to knowledge. So that is the aim of critical realism, to remove the rubbish uh, that prevents us knowing uh, the world. Um, and um, <clears throat> of course, um, that uh, presupposes uh, that there is some rubbish there. But I think most people who've uh, any experience of um, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 actually living are aware that um, we're surrounded by uh, systems of thought and belief uh, uh, which um, leave uh, much to be desired and effectively act as obstacles uh, to to gaining knowledge of uh, the world. Uh, so that's underlaboring. Now the second point is uh, seriousness. And um, uh, this concerns the unity of um, theory and practice. Now a lot of philosophy um, is uh, frankly unserious. Um, I'll give you an example of what I mean by uh, an unserious. Uh, philosophical position. Uh, this would be the position uh, that uh, the great British empiricist uh, David Hume uh, articulated when he said, uh, there's no better reason to leave the building by the ground floor than by the second floor window. Uh, so if you think about it, that's, that's absurd. Uh, but also, it's unserious because Hume didn't actually believe it. Because if he had believed it, then he would have tried to go leave buildings by the second floor window on at least 50% of occasions, which of course he didn't do. And the reason he didn't do it was because he knew there was a force, gravity, which would have pulled him to the ground. That force, uh, um, Hume couldn't uh, satisfactorily uh, put into his uh, philosophical position, uh, so he prepared to uh, he, he was he preferred to say at, uh, that uh, absurd and uh, contradictory um, epistemological um, point of view. Another example uh, from the same uh, philosopher um, uh, David Hume of unseriousness. Um, is when he said, uh, there's no better reason uh, to, distra to, to prefer the destruction of my little finger to that of the whole world. Now, this again is absurd, uh, because uh, <clears throat> surely uh, we would all feel that if there was a genuine choice like that, we should sacrifice our little finger uh, for the sake of uh, uh, the survival of the whole world. But actually, um, Hume's statement is worse than that, uh, because of course, if you choose the whole world, then you lose your little finger anyway. So, uh, it is really uh, pointless uh, not to choose your uh, little finger. Um, so, um, what uh, critical realism is concerned to do is uh, to produce a philosophy uh, 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 which you can walk, to produce a talk uh, which you can walk, um, uh, to produce um, a philosophy that you can live by and act by in the world. And if there's something which I or some other critical realist says today, uh, which you find we're not uh, uh, practicing, then you can rightly indict us uh, for being unserious. unserious. So uh, we've seen that critical realism is concerned to remove the rubbish in the way of knowledge, and uh, it's also concerned to produce a philosophy um, that you can act on. And the third feature of critical realist uh, philosophy, or the critical realist approach to philosophy, 
is that of imminent critique. And um, imminent critique means uh, that when we're uh, uh, criticizing or assessing a uh, system of thought, we do so from inside. Uh, we don't uh, put forward our own uh, objections um, against the system. We look for something within the system that we can appeal to um, mm -hmm. and perhaps that we accept uh, which the system itself mm -hmm. cannot sustain. And uh, a little reflection mm -hmm. will show you that only this kind of internal or imminent uh, critique will actually cause a transformation in uh, uh, the beliefs of the people who uh, support or hold the system. Because it shows there's something wrong from within it, uh, that they're holding incompatible views and that they need to uh, adjust something. Uh, then the fourth feature uh, that um, critical realist uh, philosophy uh, involves is uh, about our conception of uh, philosophy. So uh, our conception of philosophy is one in which it talks about the same world uh, that we live in and uh, that we have. There is only one world, and this is what philosophy talks about. Uh, however, uh, the way in which it talks about is to bring into light presuppositions of our, our, our thought or practice which we're not normally aware of. So um, you can give an example of this if you think uh, of the concept of a thing. Uh, if you think, if you look around your room now, and I was to ask you how many things there are in the room, uh, you'd be uh, a bit at a bit of a loss uh, uh, because you'd obviously count the tables and chairs. Well, perhaps you would count the people, uh, but then what about the molecules uh, constituting the tables and chairs? What about the room as a whole? Does that count as a thing in the room? Um, and a little reflection will show that that uh, kind of question is ambiguous. Similarly, if I ask you how many events are going on now um, in our um, interaction, uh, a one-way interaction at this uh, moment in time, but I hope you're going to send me lots of questions and um, most of which I will deal with at the beginning of um, the second uh, session. So um, uh, the notion of an event, um, you know, that will be a webinar, or it will be me uttering a particular sentence, or it could be you listening to me, uh, or it could be both. Um, again, it's a very ambiguous one. So. Um, what uh, uh, critical realist philosophy and what it regards philosophy at its best that it, of doing is to bring out uh, what is presupposed by our substantive practices. What you one might want to know, does the practice of shopping involve? Or uh, to choose a more uh, theory of knowledge type uh, example, what does the practice of experimentation uh, uh, presuppose about the world? That was one of the places where I began. And we'll say more, a bit more about that uh, a bit later. Um, so um, if we're employing imminent critique, and at the same time what we're do trying to do is to analyze uh, presuppositions of uh, social practices, um, we can now look at what uh, a critical realist uh, uh, philosophical account of uh, some field like science or social science could uh, aspire to. Um, uh, we could say that insofar as we're uh, critical of uh, philosophies of natural science, 
say um, that they uh, don't give us a correct, uh, a sufficiently uh, uh, deep or adequate uh, theory uh, or philosophical theory of the practice of natural science. And so what critical realism would hope to be able to do is to enhance our reflexivity as scientists so that we have a better theory of what we're nevertheless, uh, we seem more or less correctly doing. But when you come to the field of social science, it's not at all clear that um, you could be uh, at all content with what uh, social science is producing. And uh, uh, because uh, uh, philosophies of social sciences and uh, particular uh, uh, theories and systems within social science are very uh, contradictory, uh, what we could hope to do is uh, give a better uh, account of uh, a social science and a better account of uh, the world it studies. And that would not so much enhance our reflexivity, but transform our practice. So increasingly as we go on, uh, in this series of talks, we'll see the transformative or critical function of uh, critical realism uh, moving to the fore. The last feature of um, a critical realist approach to philosophy that I mentioned is also very important. This I call the principle of hermetic her her hermeticism. After um, the uh, uh, legendary um, Egyptian uh, philosopher uh, known to us by the Greek uh, name Hermes. Um, and uh, the uh, principle of her hermeticism states, don't accept anything um, that I say just because I say it. What I say, insofar as it's true, you ought to be able to work out and establish for yourself. So this is a very, very important thing. It means that if I or some other critical realist figure um, says something about how we explain an event, you don't just sit back and take notes about it, but when you go home and uh, or to work and try and explain something that's happening there, the theory that we give of your practice should work. And this is all part of being serious. Um, and it's, if it's serious for me, then it's got to be serious for you and it's got to work in practice. And if it doesn't, come back and give Gary some more questions. Okay. Well, those, so those are six um, uh, 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 features of our approach to philosophy. So now I'm going to say uh, a little bit about uh, the beginning of uh, critical realism. Uh, by critical realism, I mean the um, uh, uh, relatively modern uh, philosophy of um, critical realism. So um, this um, uh, uh, probably uh, began with the publication <laughs> of my first book, uh, A Realist Theory of Science, uh, in uh, 1975. Uh, but as I was working on it, um, it you know, it's, it's the, um, uh, the, the, the beginning of critical realism for me, of course, was my um, experience um, in, um, in writing and the experience that the writing uh, reflected of um, uh, uh, my, my experience. Um, now, uh, I, I wrote it um, uh, as a, uh, I started work on it as a graduate student. And as an undergraduate at the University of Oxford, I studied philosophy, politics, and economics. Well-known degree, PPE. Uh, and um, I, 
uh, I liked each of the three subjects roughly equally. And so it was a bit of a quandary because I wanted to pursue uh, my studies at graduate level as to which to go into. And I came to the conclusion that it would be best to go into economics because it seemed to me uh, that uh, the most important problems uh, that we faced in the world uh, were economic problems, problems of poverty, uh, problems of growth uh, inequity, uh, um, and so on. Um, and uh, I was particularly uh, concerned um, uh, when I was um, doing my undergraduate economic studies with the um, uh, problems of the uh, so-called underdeveloped countries. Uh, now we call them uh, developing countries. Um, and um, what I was concerned with and what I wanted my uh, postgraduate thesis uh, to be on was uh, the relevance of economic theory for the problems of underdeveloped countries. So that was my first uh, PhD thesis uh, title. And my intuition uh, was that it wasn't uh, very relevant. Um, that um, uh, uh, that um, uh, that one couldn't naturally assume uh, that a theory which had been developed uh, to apply to uh, um, the advanced countries of the West automatically would fit um, the uh, uh, newly emergent, uh, uh, newly decolonized uh, countries of Asia, Africa, and um, uh, Latin America. Um, so that was my um, intuition. And um, I started my uh, graduate uh, studies in a state of great uh, excitement. And uh, I won't mention their names, but I had very uh, famous uh, tutors who were well versed in both economics and uh, uh, philosophy. But I quickly came to the conclusion that it was an impossible study. Why? Uh, because it was clear from the economic uh, methodologies and philosophies of the time that one could not say anything in relation to an economic theory about the real world. That what you had as an economist were a certain set of axioms that, and it was your job uh, to uh, um, develop these axioms to be able to show their implications. And uh, the more um, un, uh, um, un, un, uh, 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 un uh, um, explained uh, um, the axioms, uh, the more uh, they didn't refer to the world as such, or they weren't taken as referring to the world, the stronger the theory. Um, in other words, you couldn't uh, compare the theory here with the world there. And the whole point of my uh, thesis was, of course, uh, therefore um, struck down. Uh, because I could only say uh, it was like uh, there was one hand, uh, but not on the other hand. So like the sound of one hand clapping, uh, my um, uh, uh, thesis appeared to be a uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a a project uh, that was unpursuable. Uh, but this itself uh, raised the problem for me. Why was economics like that? And so I went into philosophy of science, and I read a lot of books on philosophy of science. And uh, they they talked about things like uh, theory building and modeling and um, describing, explaining, predicting. Uh, uh, but there was nothing about the world in these books. They were all about human activities. 
are, are not about the world. And then uh, I went a bit further and a bit deeper. I was by now quite seriously worried. And I went back to philosophy. And uh, I went through uh, uh, modern philosophy back to uh, the uh, classical writings of uh, Kant and Hume. And there, the answer to my uh, quandary, my question, um, st uh, uh, came at me. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they had said, uh, thou shalt not do ontology. Do not talk about the world. And this was repeated again and again by John Stuart Mill, by Russell, by Wittgenstein. Uh, Wittgenstein said, don't talk about the world, talk about your talk about the world. And um, there it was. And so that's what, that is what I had to tackle. And that led me into the uh, project of uh, a realist theory of science, and of transcendental realism, and therefore of uh, critical realism. And what uh, uh, a realist theory of science had was really two uh, objectives. First, to establish that it was possible to talk about the world. It was possible, legitimate, and necessary. And secondly, uh, it uh, argued that we had to have a new understanding, a new account of the world. Because the old uh, philosophies, the old epistemologies, had in fact not been not talking about the world. They had tacitly talked about a very specific kind of world. And the kind of world they talked, they were implicitly assuming, uh, was a world which was defined by uh, the Humean theory of causality, which was the linchpin underpinning the deductive nomological model of explanation and all the theories of orthodox uh, philosophy and science. And this uh, 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 theory of causal laws. Uh, said that in order to, that, that to invoke a causal law, to, to invoke a causal law is to talk about a constant conjunction of atomistic events. And that presupposes uh, implicitly that uh, the world is uh, fixed, uh, repetitive, unstructured, and undifferentiated that the world here is the same as the world in uh, South Africa and in uh, Siberia and in Burma. Uh, and uh, that the world today is the same as it was in 1750 and as it will be in 2050. And uh, of course, uh, we know that's rubbish, uh, or at least I hope that's rubbish, but that is what was presupposed uh, by the human theory of causal laws and uh, the doctrine that what science is about is establishing empirical regularities, constant conjunctions of events, uh, which um, uh, you always can uh, uh, get. So, a realist theory of science was structured uh, around two arguments, an argument for ontology and an argument for a new ontology. And uh, most of uh, the important um, uh, distinctions of um, basic or original philosophy of um, critical realism um, stem from those, this dual argument and those two um, arguments um, encapsulated in it. So the argument for ontology is uh, the argument against its reduction uh, to epistemology in uh, modern philosophy. Now, uh, for those of you 
who are not familiar with these terms. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Ontology, I should have said this before, is uh, the theory of um, being. It's the study of being. And um, uh, critical realism argues that to understand science, you need to constitute two dimensions, uh, an ontological, or what I called an intransitive dimension of a world which is studied by science, and a epistemological or a transitive dimension of uh, which is a social world in which science uh, is articulated and develop, developed, which studies the intransitive objects of science. So we need both of these. And um, I argue that um, not having, uh, and not having sufficiently con strong concepts of both uh, was the source of uh, a lot of problems in um, existing theories of knowledge. So this argument for ontology was an argument uh, uh, against the epistemic fallacy, uh, the reductionist um, uh, uh, ontology to epistemology, for the in, for an intransitive as well as a transitive dimension, and for what critical realists call the holy trinity. The holy trinity of uh, critical realism, or basic critical realism, is the compatibility of three things. Ontological realism, that's realism about the world. Epistemological relativity, that is the idea that beliefs are socially produced, fallible, and changeable, and changing. Uh, so our knowledge uh, is, um, is relative. And uh, the third principle is that of judgmental rationality. And this says that even though our knowledge is relative, we can produce in particular contexts strong arguments for preferring one set of beliefs one set of theories uh, about the world to another. So uh, scientists have strong arguments for believing that the Einsteinian system is superior to, more true if you like, than the Newtonian system, although the Newtonian system is splendidly um, applicable in many uh, uh, in fact, your uh, context of, of its use. So, uh, uh, on this um, axis of argument, the argument for ontology, the central theorem here is the compatibility of ontological, relative, uh, ontological realism, epistemological relativism, and judgmental uh, rationality. Now, when it comes to um, the argument for uh, a new ontology, uh, there are two crucial distinctions here. Uh, there's the distinction between open and closed systems. And uh, the old philosophy of science, empiricism, neo-Kantianism, most uh, philosophical systems generally, presuppose the closed system, whereas I argued the world was an open system. Uh, only in closed systems, and especially in experimentally closed systems, do you actually get conjunctions of events. In the open system uh, world in which we live and, um, uh, and act, uh, uh, there, there, there are no uh, constant conjunctions. So that's the first ontological distinction. And then the second is the distinction between uh, um, structures and events, or uh, uh, generative mechanisms and events, or as I put it, between the domain of the real, the actual, and the empirical. So uh, the uh, the empirical uh, uh, is uh, the baseline of our empiricist and neo-Kantian philosophy. But for critical realism, there are events which haven't been experienced. 
uh, okay, so you have to have the distinction between the actual and the empirical. And then, when you get to the actual, uh, there's not only the events, but the structures and mechanisms that produce or generate them. So, um, uh, these um, uh, structures and uh, mechanisms are how uh, the generate events are the true uh, objects of scientific understanding. And they apply in open and closed systems alike. In other words, they apply where you don't get uh, constant conjunctions of events. There are still real mechanisms at work. And that's a presupposition, I argued, of experimental and applied activity. Without it, we wouldn't be able to apply our knowledge uh, uh, of uh, physics, chemistry, or any science, or including uh, possibly the social sciences at all. So this is an absolutely crucial distinction uh, between uh, structures and mechanisms that are made of the real on the one hand and the events which they generate, which are also real, uh, uh, but which are actual as well. So um, uh, now, uh, just as uh, there was a central uh, fallacy which underpinned uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, empiricist and Kantian mainstream uh, um, uh, uh, position um, uh, at, at the level of the argument for ontology, which I call the empiricist, uh, 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 the epistemic fallacy. So uh, there's a central uh, uh, error here. And this is the error of actualism. Uh, this is the error of uh, reducing uh, the possible and uh, the uh, reality of powers and tendencies and liabilities to actuality. <coughs> now, um, uh, 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 probably um, the most uh, important uh, feature of uh, this new philosophy of science, which I called uh, transcendental realism, was the idea that reality was uh, stratified. And there are three uh, important senses uh, to the concept of stratification in uh, transcendental realism. Uh, there's the distinction between structures or mechanisms on the one hand, and events and their conjunctions on the other, or between the domain of the real and the actual, uh, then there's a sense in which this uh, uh, stratification is multi-tiered uh, in, in reality. Thus, the tables and chairs in this room are constituted uh, by uh, molecules, which in turn are constituted by atoms which are constituted by electrons, which are constituted by quantum mechanical fields or uh, singularities or quarks or something else. In other words, you have uh, tiers of uh, 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 strata in science which it progressively uh, uh, unveils, reveals. Uh, and then, uh, there's a third sense of stratification, uh, which involves uh, emergence. And emergence is a very important feature of um, uh, transcendental realism and uh, critical realism. The best way um, to think about it, emergence is in terms of concrete uh, examples. So, um, we can take the example of uh, body and mind. And um, for uh, a critical realist, uh, mind is an emergent power, uh, what I characterize as a symphonic emergent power of matter 
or of body, if you like. And three features are absolutely crucial here. <coughs> First, uh, uh, the way in which um, the emergent power or property is unilaterally, existentially dependent on the more basic uh, power or property or feature. So mind is unilaterally, existentially dependent on body. That means you don't have, as far as we know, minds uh, without bodies. The second uh, feature um, is uh, that a mind is taxonomically irreducible uh, to body. That is to say, when you have mind, uh, you have um, uh, features such as motive, intentionality, reason, plan, purpose, uh, which cannot be reduced or unpacked in terms of the properties of bodies. And the third feature is uh, uh, equally important and uh, in fact is the most uh, dramatic uh, when you think about it and that is that mind is causally uh, irreducible to and efficacious in uh, the realm of body. Uh, that's to say, once you have minds, bodies are different. Once you have minds, uh, they intervene at the level of bodies. This is the way we've been intervening at the level of climate. Uh, but of course, this is what's involved in industry. This is what is involved in action. But if you think about it, this is what is involved in any human action at all. Uh, if I ask uh, uh, Rebecca, who's um, uh, sitting here beside me, uh, if I tell her I'm feeling a bit cold and could she uh, go and uh, um, uh, get a jersey uh, from my office uh, uh, a few floors up and she does that, she'll uh, move the lift uh, and um, go up to my office and move things around in my office and she is of course moving the whole time and she'll bring back my jersey. Uh, all of them will be uh, material changes at the level of body. Uh, and so these are three import, important features of, um, uh, of uh, an emergent uh, power. Uh, three important features of an emergent level uh, or emergent property uh, in uh, being. Um, and now, uh, I want to um, dwell uh, for a bit on uh, this um, uh, the, the feature of this uh, uh, new philosophy of science, um, uh, which um, is what makes it so exciting. And that is that um, when we're doing science, uh, what we're concerned with um, is not really uh, to um, uh, uh, produce a, a repetition or a confirmation or even a falsification of our experience. And what we're primarily concerned to do is to understand the causes uh, of our experience all the causes of uh, the events uh, that we uh, uh, perceive in, in uh, the world. Uh, what, what science is doing is something exciting and new. Uh, it's moving um, from a level of reality that we do understand, like say the level of tables and chairs, uh, to uh, the level of what explains them which at any moment of time, we don't understand. So science is uh, a, a wondrous thing, and uh, it um, is uh, uh, telling us about what is recognized, uh, what lies behind uh, uh, what we do know. Uh, 
and what explains uh, uh, what we uh, can observe or see. It's telling us something new. When Newton introduced the idea of gravity, he was telling us something new. Um, and um, so science is exciting and is continually expanding uh, the frontiers of uh, what we know. So let's go back to our popular um, uh, understanding of um, per, uh, 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 um, the philosophy of science. Uh, um, the empiricism that we had, uh, the empiricism and Neo-Kantianism that we had, had come unstuck uh, uh, on a uh, what's, what's called the problem of induction. So uh, this problem, uh, as you know, uh, probably know, is the problem of how uh, you move from a certain number of uh, uh, observations of a uh, conjunction or two things going together to the assumption that they always uh, go together. How do you move from uh, all the white swan, all the swans in your experience being white, or that of your community being white, to a universal statement like all swans are white? Well, of course, um, Europeans, uh, when they got to uh, Latin America, when they got to South America and to Australia, uh, quickly discovered that it wasn't the case that all swans were white. Uh, in many swans were black as well. Uh, 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 and that's uh, uh, one problem uh, with it. But the possibility of discovering a black, a black swan uh, threatens even our knowledge when we haven't got uh, uh, a uh, disconfirming uh, falsifying example like that. So if you take the statement, all emeralds are green, uh, one of our recent philosophers of science, Nelson Goodman, pointed out that this statement could be true mm -hmm. up to midnight tonight, and after midnight tonight, all emeralds could suddenly become blue. So all the evidence we have for all emeralds are green is equally evidence for the statement that all emeralds are GRU, when uh, GRU means uh, green up to midnight tonight and blue thereafter. Uh, and in fact, there is no resolution uh, to uh, the problem of induction uh, within the existing problem problem actualist problem field, within a problem field that reduces knowledge and the world to one level. Uh, of course, uh, what a critical realist scientist or what a critical realist philosopher would do would be follow what a real scientist did. And after re a real scientist uh, gets uh, what looks like uh, a, a, a meaningful uh, 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 regularity in, say, uh, the laboratory, what they do is try and fathom out why it is that these two predicates, being a green and being an emerald, are conjoined. What is it about uh, emeralds uh, that makes them green? That's what the scientist asks. And the scientist goes on to investigate the nature uh, the intrinsic qualities of uh, emeralds in virtue of which they do uh, manifest the property of being green. And, uh, in other words, uh, the, the real scientist uh, follows critical realism in moving towards the identification of a structure or a mechanism which will explain uh, the actual uh, regularity that's observed. Uh, 
Now, um, it's possible to make out a uh, a, a good um, rationale for um, in the development of science, in which science pr um, proceeds from knowledge of one level of reality to knowledge of um, the level of reality which explains that uh, original level. And it goes like this. I use the acronym D-R-E-I-C. So D is uh, description. And that's the first thing uh, that um, one does in science. That is, describes uh, the phenomena as accurately uh, as one can. And then the second move is the R, and this is retroduction. And what happens in retroduction is very important. It's neither induction nor deduction. It's distinct from both. And it is the most characteristically um, a scientific um, uh, uh, logical move. And in the retroductive moment, um, a scientist imagines a, a mechanism or structure which, if it were true, would explain uh, the uh, event or regularity in question. Um, it's, a, it's a use of the imagination uh, to posit uh, mechanisms, um, explanatory mechanisms and structures. Now, clearly, uh, you can pos posit any number of uh, explanatory mechanisms or structures. And so the third step in uh, the dialectic of scientific development and discovery is uh, given by the E. And that is, you eliminate those which are false. And then, at a false level, you come to the very exciting thing in which you can identify a real mechanism or structure at work. And the fifth step is uh, the C, in which when you can do that, then this will all often allow you to correct the results you've obtained so far. So you get D-R-E-I-C. Note two things. One, when you get to the I, then you have a reason independent of uh, manifest behavior or um, observable uh, properties, why a thing must do or must be the way it is. So according to um, uh, the um, uh, problem uh, of induction, you know, there's no reason to expect uh, that the next drink of water that I have will satisfy my, quench my thirst, and, uh, uh, um, in the way that the last did. Or there's no reason to expect why uh, if I went outside and took a walk um, uh, that I would get wet if uh, it was raining uh, any more than I did last time. But now we have our knowledge of the properties and our powers intrinsic to things which explains the way they behave, uh, the, uh, the, which explains why they behave the way they do. So that's the first thing to note, um, that you have a genuine explanation independent of the phenomena which explains it. Uh, secondly, when you get to this level, when you've identified the generative mechanism or structure at work, that is not the end of science. The next thing you do is, of course, uh, ask the question, why does that happen? Why is the world that way? And that moves you on to a new uh, cycle of um, scientific discovery and development. And so you have uh, a repeated D-R-E-I-C. Um, so this is the uh, essence of the um, transcendental realist philosophy of science, if I can put it like that. Um, uh, a, a view of science 
uh, as a social process, concerned to study um, a world outside it, which is moving from one level uh, of reality we have knowledge of to a deeper level which explains it uh, in an indefinite process. So if we have a break now, Gary, for five minutes, is that okay? Yes, it's fine, yes. You can do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, folks. So we're just going to take a, a break for five minutes. And what I'm going to do is to open the chat room up which I think it should be open now. And if anybody's got any questions that they'd like to ask Roy, um, bear in mind, keep keep them short and, and really go for questions that are qualification of understanding questions. Um, and we'll be back in five minutes. Cheers. <laughs>